So you're here now with an MSU's Now program. And this is a virtual series that we began at the beginning of the pandemic. Pandemic, Excuse me. Again, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MSU's and News. Again, most of you on here tonight are already, you already know this, but I wanted to let you know anyway. And our sponsors for tonight's program, as you can see, are Bristol Myers Squibb. We have Genentech and we have Biogen. Please say thank you. Just knowing that you're doing that, I'm I'm glad that you're thankful that they're that they're supporting us tonight. Okay, all right. Again, tonight's topic is COVID-19 and multiple sclerosis. Now, wait, you got to see this picture, right? You see this young guy on the screen? I mean, this could be Dr. Walker's son, but no, that was Doctor long ago. All right, and we just wanted to show you what a good-looking guy this guy was and still is. All right, so um, we're glad to have him online tonight, and um, and um, I just want to let you know that, what's that? Yeah, I know that, I know that, we get, we're, we're into that. So somebody's screaming out in the background here of what I should be saying next. And it's like, you know, we only have three people in this space. We're in 5,000 square feet of space and there's three of us here, there's plenty of room for social distancing. So I want to let you know though, that Dr. Al Jolson Walker, he's, uh, he's a neurologist. He's at the Medical University of South Carolina. He's been an MS neurologist for over 25 years, all right? Prior to being MS neurology, he was also a neuro, well, I shouldn't say also, he was first a neuro-ophthalmologist, all right? And later on, you might hear something about this because if you all don't ask a question about that, I am definitely gonna ask him a question because there's so much information that he could provide to how he became a neurologist from the field of neuro-ophthalmology. And it's really, really nice to hear. but. Dr. Walker has done an exceptional service for the people with multiple sclerosis in Eastern North Carolina, and I'm sure, uh, South Carolina rather, and I'm sure people come down from North Carolina to see him, and I'm gonna let him take it away right now. He's gonna speak, for you, he's gonna speak with you for about 30 minutes. So everybody, let's get ready to hear him. Take it away. Take it away, Doc. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for the opportunity as well. Uh, and I'd like also thank the sponsors for allowing this to, to go forth as well, because this is really a, a troubling time when we all consider what has happened last year and then where we are with such different conditions as well as they've gone forward. And then, of course, COVID-19, um, none of us, I think, thought that this could happen um, in our lifetime. But nevertheless, here we are. As a lot of you are fully aware of the fact is that multiple sclerosis in of itself is a very sort of difficult disorder, primarily because unlike a lot of diff different disorders out there, we still to this day do not know exactly what causes it. We certainly have ideas of the process in terms of what is going on, but not necessarily enough to say, if you don't, are not exposed to this, not exposed to that, not had this in your lifestyle, or you don't you have this or that genetic predisposition, these things we can't say yet. So therefore, a difficulty. And so for this evening, objective wise, we're going to attempt to really, if you will, go with understanding MS, understanding COVID-19 if we can, and then identify certain methodology that you might want to consider that might make a difference in your life and your lifestyle uh, in of itself as well, understanding the disorder of multiple sclerosis. Next slide, please. A lot of these slides, a lot of this information, a lot of you are going to be fully familiar with it already, and I understand that, and I apologize in advance if, if it bores you to some degree. But I've found over the years when I do these presentations, in as much as a lot of you are experts and fully informed of what MS at least thought to be, you may have family members, caregivers, other friends that may not be as learned. So therefore, what we have here is simply a slide that gives us an idea that MS in of itself is a chronic disorder. And it's autoimmune in, in nature, inflammatory, demyelinating, and it tends to attack in particular the insulation on those central nerves that one has in their head. And as a result of that removal of that insulation on those nerves, you then have a neuro deficit as a result. There's a healing process, there's a repair process that occurs as well to some degree. It takes time to do what it does, but it's not always complete and it's not always as full. Uh, accomplished as one might want it to be when it's all said and done. 
And then, of course, there's the bad guy, the COVID-19. This is a, a picture I found on the Internet that uh, seemed kind of interesting. I'm like a person got a really bad acne circumstance. But nevertheless, this has been devastating to a number of people. It's caused people to lose loved ones, as well as have others that have prolonged symptoms of pathology after that. And as a result of, it's a devastating disorder, to say the least. Next slide, please. And so what is this? It is part of this, it's a coronavirus you guys are well aware of. It's part of the SARS sort of mechanism, severe uh, sort of viral infestation, and it seems to have a predilection for certain populations. And it seems to target individuals that are on the mature or older side, but also those with lung disease, and diabetes, and other sort of chronic persistent disorders that seem to play a role. In fact, I was reading earlier today, even people with, with obesity and sickle cell anemia and others may in fact have a higher incidence of issues with the particular virus. So it seems to be targeting to some degree, but everyone is at risk. When it's all said and done, some would be more like carriers and then infect others. Others would also have a minimal uh, sort of symptomology uh, compared to other people who actually have prolonged scarring as a part of this disorder. So therefore, things to consider, things to be aware of, that it is not something that you really ever want to get or contract, also being that you need to be careful as much as possible to reduce the tendency to get it. Next slide, please. And this is a brick slide. This is actually, for those who are interested, this is actually an example of an individual that actually has a swollen optic nerve. So this is swelling. But it could also represent uh, an episode of optic neuritis, as a matter of fact. It can look similar to this. There are some subtle differences potentially, but this could look represent it as well. Next slide, please. What we're doing next is going through sort of a cursory review of the medications that a lot of you are very familiar with. Some of you have gone to, through three of these and tried them themselves. Some of the, you have reviewed through some of these and developed some concern about the side effects or the long-term complications from some of these medications. So therefore, you haven't tried them. So if you will, I'm going to go through them. I'm going to give you cursory ideas of what the drug is about um, and then move forward from there. Next slide, please. So, Copaxone. Copaxone, sometimes known as its generic name, Glutyrima acetate, and there's a generic version called Glutoba. This particular medication is one of the earlier original four. Um, and we would discuss the others as well, Abinex, beta serine and Rebif. So, Copaxone is here randomly first just because. And it, as you see here, sort of induces the immune system to um, be protected in its own way, causing a shift in these T cells. And what is interesting about this particular drug as an MS modulator is that it is that, an MS modulator, where the others that we're going to talk about are suppressive more so in terms of their mechanism to the immune system. And what is most, most interesting is that you will often see when you read anything about these medications, particularly if it's the official literature about them, is that they would say, these are the proposed mechanisms, meaning that in laboratory research, this is what they saw happen. This is what they assume in the human system also happens and then gives you X result. And that's sort of why it says that they haven't been able to necessarily confirm that, but it seems in terms of I did this, this happened, I got this outcome, it makes sense. And the other thing to keep out uh, keep in mind with this particular medication is that back in the olden days when we used to use categories, categories A, B, C, that sort of thing, this particular drug is also being considered category B. And that means that it's been studied, it's been identified to be safe in pregnancy, also to not affect uh, breast milk and so forth, to any significance that mattered. And so as a result, often a drug given to people who are of childbirth potential, unsure whether or not they are going to conceive or not, so therefore this drug is often given as a consideration. And the other thing that often comes up as a question um, as we go through is, which one is the strongest? Which one is the best? To be honest with you, it's the medication that works best 
in you, for you, with minimal side effect yet benefit? That, that's actually the true answer because each of us is different and unique enough that I can't say to you that this drug is going to work for you as well as it did for the patient who just left the room because you're different. So therefore, not, not a guarantee. Next slide, please. The interference, and, and this includes your, your Avonex, your Rebiv, your Plegrity, your Stavia as well. And they're sort of globally considered interference. Are they the same medication? They are not. Do they have unique differences? They do. But as a group, they term interference, and so their side effect profiles are very similar. The difference typically is related to how they're administered. If it's Avonex, it's an IM injection. If it's Rebif, it's an under the skin injection. If it's Plagrity, it's also under the skin injection. If it's Stavia, also under the skin. And so my point to you is that the means of administration might in fact change the side effect profile to some degree as well. But when you look at mechanism, you'll see this commonality, reducing the T cell population, reducing the B cell population, which you'll see when you get to the more recent medications, because originally when MS was being studied and medications developed for it, it was really thought that the primary target should, could be the T cells. So therefore you'll see T cell mentioned repeatedly in the earlier medications, which would be your, your interferons as well as your copaxone for that matter. And then you'll see B cells being the primary conversation in a more recent uh, medication. And then those that sort of split the difference, we're talking about T cell and B cells as part of their target. Next slide, please. Then it's Tysabri, which is one of the uh, first injectable or rather infusible medications given once every 28 days. And it is one of them, I guess some would say more and more potent, if you will. But what really came to light with the came to Tysabri is that it is, in fact, potent, effective, but the others can be as well to be honest with you. But what really became different in this particular medication was this idea of a medication that suppresses the immune system enough that you may in fact be predisposed to another potential complication or side effect. And that ties to this PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. That's what it ties to, meaning that if you, in fact you have the JC virus in you as an individual, which 60% of the population apparently does, then with this medication, you're at risk for that virus becoming activated and then causing significant harm, um, sometimes even leading to death. And so their methods and, and a pattern of how to monitor that risk, if you will, and reduce it substantially. And your uh, neurologist and healthcare provider can do that workup for you and actually identify that as a, as a situation, if you will, but an effective, uh, medication in the world of MS, to say the least. Next slide, please. Delinea claimed to fame primarily is that it was the first medication that was actually FDA approved and was, was oral. It was one of the first. And as a result, that reality it sort of gained a lot of sort of traction from that point of view, but it too had its own issues, but nevertheless, it is one of the few medications that once a patient starts taking, and it does require EKGs, an eye examination, things along that line, primarily because of the fact that there were side effects that were identified or concerns that were identified related to those, those systems, if you will. So therefore, the EKG, therefore the eye exam, and then blood tests as well, looking for certain uh, possibilities uh, that you may or may not have as a situation. And this medication therefore requires typically a first dose observation for those reasons where they monitor you for about six hours, your vital signs taking each hour on the hour, but the majority of patients, let's say that 95% or so of the time, once they're on it, they tend to stay on it because side effect profile wise, it is pretty minimal in general for a large number of patients. But once again, a very effective oral agent uh, as a medication. Next slide, please. <laughs> And, and then, of course, this slide attempts to give us an idea of its mechanism. Use that fancy word, sequestration. All it really means, guys, is that when white blood cells are being produced, in this case, inside of lymphocytes, this particular medication has the ability to, in fact, keep those white blood cells, a majority of them, at home. They're and not entering the bloodstream, not entering circulation. As a result, it lowers your white count. 
So therefore it reduces the tendency for these then cells to then cross over into what is termed the blood brain barrier, which is sort of this barrier that separates your brain, if you will, from your bloodstream. And as a result of that, it then keeps these white blood cells from entering and therefore the odds or opportunity for you then to have an MS event or MS attack or MS exacerbation is dramatically reduced. And the effects of that overall are dramatically reduced. And that's the, sort of the idea with the sequestration. But as you will see, each medication has a methodology of making that same process happen, just how they do it is different. Next slide, please. And this just gives you uh, sort of a list of the other uh, two agents that are also uh, SP1, and they have sl slightly tweaking methodologies within themselves. It's a little different how they're administered, but they also do some aspects of the sequestration as well. Next slide, please. Then there's Lemtrata. Well, Lemtrata is one of the few, if you will, that targets this CD52. And you notice here T cells and B cells. Hmm, interesting. And so once again, as I mentioned to you earlier, the T cells were the initial targets in the earlier medications. And then as we move through, you see T cells, but you also see the addition of B cells as well. This particular medication, primary claim and fame overall, and in fact it's effective for MS, is that it is given uh, less frequently, meaning that the first year you uh, treat it over a 10 day period on average, and then the next year, uh, a shorter period of time. And then what happens is that you actually won't get treated again unless something has happens at three years or five years, usually at five years. And some people have gone longer than that. So it is one of the few that sort of has that usual, that unusual sort of uh, methodology and pattern administration, but also this longevity that may in fact be ideal for you. But once again, the key is to find the medication that works for you as an individual. Next slide, please. Then it's Tecfidera. Uh, once again, one of the oral medications and it too had its own methodology of actually suppressing the immune system, if you will. And you see the targeted cells here, the inlooking four, five, and the inlooking 10. And, it, and it, this particular medication uh, induces apoptosis, if you wonder what that means. It means it kills basically activated T cells. And so this targets T cells preferentially. And so as a result, it then gives a situation or causes a situation wherein these now activated or potentially circulating uh, cells won't uh, then attack your brain system, as we mentioned to you guys earlier. Once again, different methodology of getting to the same sort of endpoint. Next slide, please. And, and these are uh, others, Fumarity, as well as the other uh, monomethyl fumarate. These are other medications that have a similar mechanism. They're different in that the side effects may be more uh, benign, if you will. How they're administered may be a little different as well, um, but the mechanism to how they get to where they're effective is similar. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the side effects could be less or different. Once again, the fact that you don't respond to one or you have side effects in one doesn't necessarily translate to the same side effects or concerns in the other, even though they may be in the same family. Next slide, please. This is a bio, a pill as well. And this one actually has a slightly different mechanism of action as well, but is it very, but the third point, which you see there is cytostatic effect on proliferating T and B cells. Once again, you see that combination T and B cells. And what it really says is that it puts these, these T cell and B cells in a holding state, if you will, it reduces their production. And once again, same idea, reduction of white blood cells, um, that therefore may later on injure the myelin in your central nervous system and then cause the exacerbation or injury accordingly. And this is sort of another way of getting to that same point. Once again, a different medication. And Abagio, it has other unique aspects to it as well, but a key thing that it is a pill is a once a day pill uh, compared to some that are twice a day and then others that are also once a day. Next slide, please. The Mavinclad. Clydrabine. Clydrabine in of itself is a really old, old um, medication which had a very different indication originally um, and then modified and studied 
heavily, if you will, and found to be an effective medication when it comes to multiple sclerosis. And it uses a slightly different word. It uses the word cytotoxic effects on B cells and T cells, uh, which basically means it kills them off. Uh, injures them significantly so where they don't uh, enter your central nervous system as well. Once again, uh, same general idea, different methodology of getting there um, with the outcomes being, generally speaking, the same. Uh, in that you want reduction in these cells because they're the guys that are recognizing incorrectly for whatever reason, your myelin as infection or your myelin as uh, dangerous in some way, and it just sort of attacks it. And then with, as a result of that, you have a deficit as a result, ultimately. And, and because of the methodology used here, this particular medication might cross over and also affect other cell types, uh, which is not necessarily ideal, but it may, it may in fact do that. Next slide, please. Benzocrevus, and this is one of the medications that is also known as ocrelicanide. Uh, also that is infused. And this medication is given IV. Um, and it's given for most patients once every six months, for some once every five months based on what their CD20 count might be. And this one suppresses pretty dramatically and often used as an alternative to maybe denatalizumab or if a person's had failures in some of the other medications, they may often end up uh, taking Ocrevus as an infusion. I guess and one of the major advantages to it is that it's given infrequently once every six months. So the benefits last uh, for an extended period of time from that, from that point of view. And of course, there are side effects. They all have side effects uh, with this medication. There is potentially a, a risk for the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, but it also applies to the tefidera. It also applies to the gelinia and others. Just to be honest with you, the incidence is much smaller when compared to the natalizumab granted, uh, but they all have some of that risk as well. And then some, they in fact have a risk of cancer as well. Once again, small as a general rule, uh, but it, it, it is there. And often when one thinks about aggressive when it comes to medications, that's when the side effect profile becomes uh, a problem for those in particular who are risk averse, to say the least. Next slide, please. And this drug that uses a similar mechanism, uh, so it also CD20 is more, one of the more recent additions to the armamentarium. And I would tell you, when I started um, in neurology, uh, my goodness, 30 years ago, I guess, a long time ago, um, there were no medications that were FDA approved to treat multiple sclerosis. What we were using were medications that were immune suppressors, and some of them actually uh, are still used even today. And it's, it's the style and methodology, but they didn't have a lot of evidence to support what we were doing with them. And so what often would happen is if you train at a center that had people who had experience with these medications, you became uh, individual who used those same methods, those same styles, and typically had the same outcomes, sometimes great, sometimes not so great. Uh, and so the, once the FDA approved medications, then globally we would have an opportunity to make differences uh, in patient in patient's outcome. And I will tell you that my clinics often in the past, when I first started, patients were often on, on, in wheelchairs, often on stretchers, and that was a more of a common view. And you had the occasional patient who was still ambulatory, the occasional patient who looked, uh, for the most part, uh, usual, meaning that they didn't seem to have any outward uh, symptoms or suggestions that they had a disability, to say the least. And of course, now with the advent of these FDA approved medications, that's changed dramatically. It's commonplace for individuals to come to the waiting area, walk through there, and have no idea that those patients have multiple sclerosis or have any uh, ailment or chronic disorder of any type because of the fact that a large percentage of patients do very, very well to the point that in time, they still continue to do well and been on medication for some years. Uh, next slide, please. The treatment. Now we have the viruses. Right now, as far as I, can, I know, there are only two FDA-approved treatments for the COVID-19 circumstance. And that's the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. They're unique in terms of how they do their business, if you will. 
they are both using a messenger RNA sort of uh, carrier. And with that, it then creates a situation where your immune system codes for the right surface molecules that emulate the actual COVID-19 virus just in the right place. And as a result, you generate antibodies as though you were infected already, and you're not, antibodies that then protect you from a future, uh, potential future infection or exposure to the COVID-19 infection or virus, I should say. Um, and that's sort of the methodology. And the subtle differences between how the two uh, vaccines work, but in general, the mechanisms are very similar for both from that perspective. Next slide, please. Yeah, right. And so the Pfizer folks, when they designed their study, they included individuals that were 16 years and older. And so their data supports that age group at upwards. And so for them, after you've gotten the second shot and then given it two, probably four weeks for it to reach its max benefit in most cases, then you're at 95 percent protected was the, was the idea. And that applies to a large percentage of the population, maybe a majority um, as well. And it didn't seem, at least in their study, that there was a difference between the groups um, in terms of performance, whether you were 16 or 60. It seemed to be the same. Next slide, please. The Moderna vaccine, they studied people who, who are 18 and older, so it doesn't, no, doesn't go quite down this low, um, but it's important uh, and still effective. Its percentage was 94.1, which is probably not that dramatically different than what we get with the uh, Pfizer at 95. And it also protects, if you take the data and split it up, slice it by age group, and look at it a little deeper, there was potentially maybe not as efficacious in people who were 65 and older, but I don't know that that was statistically significant, but it did have that little subtlety that people weren't sure why it was that way, why if it's even real ultimately as well. So it may not be something that matters, but it was noticed and then reported as well. But as a general rule, if you are able to get the Moderna vaccine, get the Moderna vaccine. Uh, if you're able to get the Pfizer vaccine, get the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, because they will protect you in general uh, well enough that at least, at least from the point of view of fatality, is extremely unlikely. And, and, and then both are good at doing that. And then there are also reports that people uh, don't get, seem to get sick in general as frequently as well. But we've uh, all seen reports where people have been vaccinated and simply had uh, got the COVID uh, infection anyway. However, then one wonders, did they get the original COVID infection or just now this alternative that we're now reading about this variant? Once again, the data is still out and it's still early, and when it's all said and done, we're still trying to sort of get the dust to settle and identify where are we with uh, vaccinations, where are we with individuals who are chronically immunosuppressed, because often for most of these studies, we were not necessarily included, if you will, um, when it comes to the patient with MS who's also on immunosuppressive medication. Now, keep in mind, if you have MS alone, MS by itself, not taking a DMT, a disease modifying therapy, or an immunosuppressive medication, then your risk of getting the COVID-19 infection is not different than anyone else in your age group, because MS by itself does not immunosuppress you. Just keep that in mind. Now, once you're on an immunosuppressive medication, the medication puts you at risk as a general rule. Okay, next slide, please. And then J&J, &J, I think what I have seen recently is that they are coming up for approval tomorrow. However, um, I just heard someone say uh, very recently that they thought it happened yesterday, so I'm not sure. But its biggest claim to fame is gonna be First of all, that it is a single 
shot versus Moderna and Pfizer, which are two shots that you guys are all aware of. And how it is formulated is different. The age group that they also are looking at is a little different as well. And so we're waiting to see what we get with the J&J vaccine. Some of the numbers don't seem to be as robust, if you will, meaning that for individuals looking at Pfizer or Moderna, we get 94.5 to 95% effectiveness. The J&J was not quite as robust as that. At least the early studies that they've been releasing have not suggested that but yet it seemed to still reduce dramatically fatality, dying from the virus. Uh, so still, I think a reasonable consideration, a very reasonable consideration, um, considering this one, it's one, it's one shot, but we have to sort of wait and see uh, about it for us thus far. Next slide, please. So timing. So the common question that I get for the last 12 months has been what to do. So a number of entities have looked at this, a number of specialists, neuroimmunologists um, and specialists in virology have looked at this. And so I got this from the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's webpage. And basically, you look at Avonex, beta serine, Clopaxone, Extavia, Plegrity, Rebiv, Avigio, as well as Tecfidera, Tysabrin, Vimerity, basically the medicines in that group sort of mentioned here, because of how they work, their mechanism, we, we were discussing briefly earlier, you can, once you're on, you can get your injection, not concern yourself about delaying, because what's the concern? The concern is not that you can get COVID-19 from the vaccine. Remember, they're not using any active components from the actual infection itself. What they're doing is taking a molecule that can create assimilation, if you will, a similarity, if you will, and then have you generate these antibodies not using any components of the virus. So therefore getting the COVID-19 infection should not be possible. Okay, so with that idea in mind, then what's the important part? The important part is that if you are immunosuppressed, will you mount a similar efficacious number of antibodies to protect you? And that's where this timing comes into play. That's the importance of that part of the equation. And so with the prior slide that we saw earlier, what it's saying is that when you're on your interferon or in the midst of that list that we saw earlier, that you can take your shot and reasonably anticipate that you will mount an adequate immune response to be protected. Now, keep in mind, a lot of this is early. A lot of this is not perfect as of yet, but that's what the data has suggested thus far. Now, where are the differences? L look at this slide here. You got Lemtrada, you got Mavinclad. And here, because the mechanisms to which these medications work are more likely than not suppress the robustness of how the vaccine might generate, this suggests potential delay. So therefore, if you haven't started taking the, the uh, medication as of yet, allow at least four more weeks from from your last injection if you're doing the two shots last injection and then take your immune suppressive medication and you're less likely to have a significant reduction in the efficacy of the vaccine itself and if you're already on it then as you see here then they want you to do uh, a 12-week uh, sort of delay from when you took it from the time that you get your injection. So once again, each of these slides has a slightly different nuance, and I've sort of listed it here. And once again, as mentioned, this came from the National Immune Society's uh, website. Um, and, and if you look at the list of physicians that validate this, these are some of the top people in the country and outside of them as well. Next slide. 
That may be the last slide. Okay. Uh, so, so as we have gone through this, what I want you to keep in mind is that a lot of this is still in its infancy, to say the truth. And we're still learning day by day what works, what doesn't work. And so what we're trying to do at this point is put our best foot forward. And with the information that we now have, I think we're able to do that for the most part. Does everyone need to take the vaccine? Probably. Is everyone going to take the vaccine? Probably not. And so therefore we get into this idea of herd immunity and things along that line. I'm not a neuroimmunologist um, or a virologist for that matter. And so therefore I can't tell you for sure how well that will work because the other things keep in mind, we don't know that if you've been vaccinated and you've mounted the proper response, yet 95% protection, okay? But could you still be a carrier? Meaning that you can go from your home to a location where people were infected, you didn't get sick, can't, you don't get the, the illness in any, in any way, but now go to another location, take that virus with you, and now infect other people who, who happen not to be vaccinated and so forth. No one knows the answer to that question as of yet. We will know the answer to that question, right? We, we don't know. And so therefore, mask wearing and, and, and those sort of protections, staying within a distance away from people, still may be, still should be probably an ideal thing to consider to continue as a behavior until we know the other parts. Because it's comfortable, I'm comfortable in saying to you that with the vaccination in the proper situation, you probably are protected. But then that's, I mean, your neighbor is, your friend is, your other relative is. So keep those things in mind as you uh, matriculating about the community, um, okay, if you will, please. I think I've gone over my time. So um, I think the question to be asked at this point. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing this program. And uh, I usually start off every program with a mask, and here I am partway through and just wearing it now. Yeah. All right. Um, it's very much needed, but I heard you speaking about masks, so I thought it was a good time to put it back on, all right? Very good. All right. I know it's hard for people to hear me. Again, I am in a space that's huge. There's three of us only in this room. We're very well spread apart, and we know how to do it, okay? So, doctor, thank you very much for speaking. That was a very, very educational uh, program. I, I wasn't expecting it like that, but it was it was very useful, very much needed. Okay, so thank you. All right, we do have a lot of questions. There are some people that are typing them in online right now. And for others, we did take a lot of questions from people as they were uh, registering for the program. So for those that are asking questions online, I am going to say your first name as, um, you know, as I'm reading it off. And um, those, though, that sent it in online, I don't have your name with this, so I'm sorry about that. But if you do have any questions to ask and, um, you know, and you want your name mentioned, again, first name only, then uh, I will say that. So the first one, though, is from a person that is not COVID related. It is not MS related. They want to know something about you personally. All right. And this is from Maria in South Florida. And she wants to know if you wear a bow tie because you're wearing it in honor of Dr. Mark Charcot. <laughs> well, if I knew Dr. Mark Charcot, I probably would. But no, uh, the, the bow tie is part of my natural dress. I, uh, whenever I go to, I'm at work, go to work, I wear a bow tie. I have hundreds of them to the point that patients actually bring bow ties and give them to me to wear and so forth. But uh, thank you for the question. I happen to like bow ties. As a child growing up, my dad wore bow ties and he taught me to tie one by the time I was 10 or so years of age. And I have been tying them ever since. I thought it was the coolest thing to be able to go someplace at the end of the day and pull it. It's like Jane Bond look, some kind of thing. But yes, ma'am. <laughs> Great. Well, see, Maria, I was right. OK, he does it because he he likes the style. OK, there you go. All right. And I personally normally wear a boat. I don't wear a bow tie. I normally wear a tie everywhere. But today I didn't bring a second tie with me. And because I wore this earlier at our other program, I didn't want to be wearing the same tie twice today. So here you got it. You got me without it. OK. All right. So now let's get to some vaccine questions and other questions that are related to multiple sclerosis. I'm going to go back and forth. Um, 
there are vaccine questions. There are questions about MS. And I want to just take it for, um, you know, mixing it up. All right. Yeah. So the first one, this I thought is a very good question. Um, they, the person is asking which vaccine or is there a vaccine that is to be taken more appropriately for the type of therapy that he or she is on? Okay, so as you saw in those last three slides, we listed the different medications and then listed sort of when you take it. It turns out that right now, as far as we can tell, that either of the two is fine. Now, I've read that there will be some vaccines coming in the future that are more the standard design, meaning that they attenuate a source of huge heat or some methodology to sort of stop the, the virus from being as virulent, if you will. That type of an inoculation is contraindicated uh, or, or in a person who is immunosuppressed. So the future vaccines, I would suggest, may be problematic in that, re that regard because of design. These two that we now have are fine. Either one is fine. Even though I think we do have some, some saying there's a preference towards the Pfizer vaccine as opposed to Moderna. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so another one is, um, um, and I don't know if you, you talked about this before, but you know, we, we hear this in so many of our programs, and um, I just want to ask you so you can answer it for those that are on here. Maybe they do not know. Are any of the vaccines a live virus? Oh, I see. Okay. So, as I mentioned, is that these two that we have now are not, but they're those in the future coming that will be attenuated so they were a live virus. Yes. And that's why these are safe for you now. The others may not be. Okay. Now, going back to something that you mentioned about Johnson & Johnson, yes, while you were online, I did check to see if it was FDA approved yesterday. It was not, okay? I thought it was. I, I'm pretty sure I saw it on a lot of the news channels, but yes, there's a little glitch, like you said, and they uh, Johnson & Johnson has to answer that. But now that I'm speaking about Johnson & Johnson, is that one of those that is notice, um, noticed to be a live virus? So, but I went through, I didn't look at that detail. I sort of memorized, learn things that are approved and not approved. I don't know. Do you have to now answer that question? I've heard not, but, um, but if that's my, not. I've, that's I've also heard yes. So <laughs> I've heard it both ways. So, um, Understood. So, I, so I don't actually know about that one. I've also heard from some doctors that it's supposed to be a once only injection. And now I've heard from another doctor that said it's going to be given twice. Oh, I see. So it's clearly its claim to fame was injection once for sure. And when it's attenuated, I don't think so. I saw where they're talking about it create, it uses um, adenovirus uh, as its vehicle, as I recall. And as such, it should not be attenuated using that methodology. So I think it's going to be safe, but don't know for sure. Okay. And is the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine then, since it's not a uh, mRNA, is it safe still for MS patients? Because they use an adenovirus as its, as its carrier, it should be. But like I said, because it's not FDA approved, we don't have a lot of data on it yet for actual use. So I would stick with, for the moment, the Moderna and Pfizer, because I know for sure they are, this one should be, but still the verdict is out just thus far. Okay, thank you. Elaine would like to know if there is aluminum in any of those three vaccines that we know about already. Oh, wow. I was apologize to her. I don't know. Um, me, neither, me neither. So, I'm with you. I, I know why she's asking that question, and uh, this is also in the odor and so forth. Um, I don't know that we even know that that is a risk factor for even the MS, the people so that debate it all the time. You said that you know why she's asking that. Can you tell the rest of us, please? Oh, sure. Uh, so so there, there is um, suggestion, if you will, out there for years that aluminum, aluminum exposure, chronic aluminum exposure may in fact predispose you to multiple sclerosis, create the risk and risk factors. And there's never been truly conclusive evidence that's actually correct. 
and that's been one of the ongoing problems. Once again, no surprise, right? Because because we don't know what causes MS, then it's difficult, therefore, to say, okay, wow, for sure, wow, for sure. More likely than not, it may be multifactorial, environmental, as, as well as uh, situational, as well as maybe genetic. It's, I mean, it's just a ton of things because when you look at the average family, there's a single person in that family, irrespective of how big it is, that has MS. And so therefore, it's suggesting a certain randomness, because you would assume that they got the similar exposure in the same household, similar environment, and so forth, and yet only one person has it. And granted, I have situations, families, where dad does, mom does, uh, you know, mom does, children do. I understand that. But they are the minority by far when it comes to uh, presenting with multiple sclerosis. It's usually just a single family member in most cases. Okay, so another quick question about the Johnson & Johnson, and then we'll move on, is that because it is less efficacious than the Pfizer or Moderna, might it be then that we, it would require to be vaccinated more often than what they're thinking right now? I mean, is there any discussion on that? Um, I haven't seen any discussion on that, to be honest with you. However, I have seen discussion where people are saying that even the two that we already have may actually require us to get a, re, a, a redo, if you will, meaning a uh, month, once, once a year, once every 18 months. This data suggests that they might not hold up long term either. So I think that is an issue that's going to uh, sort of permeate the sort of the, the, the environment workspace until we figure that part of the equation out as well. Right, 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 right. OK, great. So. Um... It's quite true. And I, I would hate to think that, uh, you know, in um, another five months from now, four months from now, when they start seeing the results of everybody who who was able to get the vaccine in January, that they're finding, hey, it wasn't substantial enough and we have to do this all over again. You know, we got to get 300 million more dosages out there and everybody's got it. Everybody that's had it thus far has got to go through it again. So. Um, you know, more stress, I guess, right? Yes, sir. All right, next question. Will the dispensers know which vaccine is, okay, that would, question, we already did that. See, somebody tried tricking me. They did it online and they gave it on paper. I, they gave it originally up front. Um, so the next one, let's see, um, would you recommend your MS patients to stay on their current DMTs during this pandemic? Yes, well, let's, let's put it this way. Early on, when we knew nothing, we, we knew nothing at all. Patients would email me, writing me, come to the clinic as well, and would ask them to stop their medication because they were fearful. No one knew enough. I didn't know enough. And so I had some patients say, stop their medications. I was fully aware of it. I said, hey, I, you know, I understand your risk. I understand your concern. I can't tell you exactly what not to do or to do because I'm ignorant of the facts as well, as much as you are. And I understand your fear. So we had patients who stopped. Knowing okay. what we know now, I would have them continue and not stop. Okay. Now, if you had a if you had a patient that's using one of the medications though that is a little bit more risky than others for for during this pandemic, and if that person turned out COVID positive, all right, that they became infected, would you leave them on that medication or would you move them to something else? So more often than not, to be honest with you, it's usually taken out of my hands. The doctor's taking care of him. Stop it, <laughs> without a doubt. So, so the general accepted standard is, as a general rule, if they become COVID infected, often their medication is stopped. Okay. All right. Next, um, another important topic that comes up with all this is if a person has a Pfizer vaccine and they're due to get a next one three weeks later. Okay. Um, that would be the standard protocol on Pfizer but they can't get it and they're freaking out that they can't get it. And then they don't know where Pfizer is even available. I mean, they may be in a remote area and they find out that only Moderna is available where they are. What would you tell them to do? Should they wait for the Pfizer? I mean, how much time do they have to wait, not get a vaccine? How much time do they actually have? Or should they just jump on board and take that Moderna? So there's this debate on that as well, as you might imagine, no one exactly knows. But I have heard tell, if you will, people who are mixed 
they, they've actually taken a, the Pfizer and then because of availability circumstances taken the Moderna, they, they've mixed it. Um, because their mechanism is similar, both using messenger RNA, at least in my head from a logical point of view, it seemed like you could do that. However, that's not standard, it's not studied that way. There's no evidence that it should work if you do it that way, but logic says it might work. Um, and during how, how long is the window of opportunity? Can you wait longer? Uh, certainly the design of these medications were to identify the shortest, uh, most efficacious moment of time that you take it. So one is three weeks, I think, and one is four. Um, and then you get the injection, meaning that reduced side effect potential, maximum benefit, what's that window? And it turns out three weeks for one, four weeks for the other. Can you go longer than that? And I've seen data suggest that you can go, you can go four weeks, five weeks, six weeks later. Um, but the efficacy potentially might drop if that's the case. Uh, and, and that's what, you know where the sort of rub comes into play. But what this person's question is, it's a legitimate question. I think that's going to uh, arise uh, frequently. I think in the next three to six months, we're going to know without a doubt that the combining the two, Pfizer and Moderna in one person works or doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Um, Judy just wrote in that uh, Dr. Google says there's no mercury or aluminum in the COVID vaccines. Ah, congratulations. Okay, thank say, say thank you, Dr. Google. Okay, <laughs> all right. Next, um, person writes, a person writes, I've read that monoclonal antibodies can lower the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine. Is there any evidence or indication that taking Tysabri may lower the efficacy of the vaccine? Certainly, it's a monoclonal antibody. And, and in fact, to be honest with you, Sozo Crevis is a monoclonal antibody. Uh, and, and there's actually a couple of others that are MS drugs that are monoclonal antibodies. And the, the monoclonal antibody mechanism itself, could it? It's possible, which is why if you look at the sort of diagram that I gave you earlier on that last slide, why you, you wait and, wh and why you actually try to get the maximum benefit from that vaccine before you take that next injection or that next infusion or that next pill, uh, because there is potentially the risk of lowering. Now, here's the other part of the question, lowering it how much? So if it's working 95 percent, it lowers you to 90 percent. Does that matter? I mean, once again, we have a vaccine about to be FDA approved, and I think its best numbers are 68% or so, 70% or so, and yet it's, it's, it's going to make the rounds of being FDA approved. We're looking at the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So my point to you is that if it lowers it 5%, 6%, 8%, that's probably not enough to matter. I think if you're on a medication that's a monoclonal antibody, take your injection because I think it's reasonable to assume that in your situation, the best outcome is to have both on board. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a different question for you, and that is Kay would like to know, does a patient need to wait for their optic neuritis to resolve before getting COVID vaccine? So the question there is a little bit different. So, so you have an active, ongoing inflammatory event, one. Two, the standard for that is often to give you IV steroids, which also will immune suppress you. Okay, keep that in mind. It brings on a white count, it, it reduces the inflammatory response. It sometimes can hasten the recovery, depending on if it's your first episode versus subsequent episode of optoneuritis. And then should you get your vaccine at that point in time? I probably wouldn't get it at that, at that point in time. Um, to be honest with you, if it was an active event like that, I would wait until that calms itself down. So that's the same then for anything that could be causing a relapse of any type then. If a person right. is being put onto um, the, a, a steroid, then now, by the way, does that work for oral steroids and or the um, infusion steroid? It, 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 would work, it would work in both cases, yes, sir. Because typically, when it's oral, the they use often use a dose equivalent to the IV, and so therefore, so the effect is going to be similar in both circumstances. Okay. K also writes: Do CD4 counts need to be above 300 before getting the vaccine? And since nobody else probably understands what that's about, can you explain that? Okay, so basically there are a number of different immune molecules that are, are monitored heavily. And so as a result of that, what we're trying to do is keep a patient healthy and safe as they 
they are suppressed by these medications. And so what she's alluding to is one of the markers, if you will, and that those would suggest that that number being well above 300 um, allows the individual to then probably mount a more reasonable immune response. Uh, and that's somewhat debated as well. So ideally above the 300 is where you want it to be. Okay, thank you. Now, Cindy writes a very long paragraph and we'll see where this is going, but I'm gonna have to read it to you because I never got to finish it. Okay, I was on Tysabri for almost two years with an increasing JCV level every time tested. Last infusion, I had a bad enough reaction to it, which caused me to be hospitalized. Seizures, could not speak, could not walk, etc. After getting my second dose of the vaccine, I'll be starting Lemtrada. So after she gets her second vaccine, she'll be starting Lemtrada after a period of time. Um, well, did I, I lost a second here. But my concern with starting the Lemtrada after what happened with Tysabri is... Sorry, Cindy, and sorry, everybody else, but I got to move the cursor because it's very long and I went off, off my screen. All right. So my concern with starting the Lemtrada after what happened with Ty Sabri is that I will be more prone to having a similar reaction. Certainly, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but would you have any opinions on whether a person with bad PML-like reaction to Ty Sabri, should this be of concern for someone starting on Lemtrada? Oh, I see. As you mentioned, not, not knowing her personally in her particular exact circumstance is always hard, but but certainly um, it too, the Lemtrod is a significant immunosuppressor. Um, how it acts, where it acts in your immune system is very different than that you see in what is something known as Tysabri or Natalizumab. It's different. Um, are you at risk for the same adverse reaction? Less likely, to be honest with you. You should do okay. You should do, I think, well uh, as a general rule with a different medication. But once again, uh, there's always a risk to any of these situations. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Um, before I go on with the questions, I want you to tell us why you converted from being a neuro-ophthalmologist and that's a tough word to spell, by the way, ophthalmologist, all right, and to being a MS neurologist. Oh, I think, certainly. So as a neuro-ophthalmologist, we, we are the, sort of the investigators of unusual, unexplained vision loss, vision change, vision alteration. And so you might imagine patients with MS, particularly in, in what we call now the olden days, would come in and because MRIs were not as standard as they are now, patients would come in, they have unexplained vision loss. They would have unexplained double vision, unexplained uh, transient, other changes in their vision. They see that they have nystagmus, they have all these little subtleties that sometimes would be missed. And so the neurotomology would identify it. And then with that examination being done, often now adding to that the neuroimaging study, the MRIs, we would then often be the individual who would identify initially that a person has all the ramifications of what we now call no as multiple sclerosis. As, as time progressed, what then happened is patients would like to have the person that diagnosed them, but also work with them who happened to also be a neurologist to continue to follow them. And so as time progressed, as the numbers began to increase, became sort of reasonable um, uh, to move towards the sort of full Monty and do it all. So for a long time, I did neurotomology formally as well as neurology and was in both departments for a lot of years. Now, primarily just in the neurology side, even though even in neurology, I have a slit lamp, I have all this, I have very similar tools that I had also in ophthalmology uh, as well. Okay, thank you for that. All right, back to some COVID questions. Wow, we got a quite a few more here, right? Um, does the vaccine prevent you from carrying it? In other words, if you've been vaccinated, does it prevent you from carrying it to another person that has not gotten the vaccine yet? We do not know. That, that is a beautiful question, perfect question, and we don't know. That's why I mentioned to you earlier that it becomes still important that even though you yourself may not get sick, may get infected, however, you still need to mask up now more so not to protect you, but protect that other person um, from the potential outcome. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, then next one, I have allergies to tree nuts. Should I take, should I wait before I take the vaccine? Do I have to have the vaccination? 
So I well, guess this person, yeah, is just confused and maybe saying, I don't know. I, I don't know if they expect to lose their allergy, but um, I guess they're going to have to take the vaccine, right? Or your opinion? Uh, right. So, so basically, uh, which I think what she's getting at is that recently we've come to become aware of the fact that people that have a significant number of allergies, and, and usually it's more than just one allergy. Usually they may have asthma. They also may have skin allergies. They may have situations where they tend to be allergic to every and anything. Those individuals might, in fact, mount a more so or a significant um, immune response, allergic reaction to the injections. And that's been reported um, ever so often. I think the overall incidence is not that large, but that has been sort of implicated um, out there and suggested that those individuals might want to sure they take their injection on a Friday so they have the weekend to recover uh, and that sort of thing. But once again, the single allergy that you mentioned in particular, I'm not aware of that being a problem in and of itself. Uh, but certainly if you have other allergies as well or tend to be allergic to most things that you're administered, something to be aware of that you may actually have a reaction. Great. Thank you for that. Before I continue with the questions again, I, I want to thank everybody that's on here. It's extremely rewarding for me to see when we have a, a, a big audience. I mean, it's, it's rewarding even when we have a small audience, right? But um, it's really nice to see everybody on here and following this MSU's Now event that we do each month. And, um, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, speaking about COVID, getting the updates. And I'm glad to see a lot of the people I see several of the names that are continuous each month, and I'm glad that you're here. Thank you very much. So that way you can learn and possibly bring this information to others that you know, whether on social media or people that you might have, you know, known ones from support groups, live in-person support groups. Maybe you're doing it online now with uh, your local, you know, your normal support group. You might be doing Zoom meetings or, or whatever platform it might be, but I do appreciate that you're here and picking up this knowledge and going elsewhere. And in a few minutes, I'm gonna to talk to you about something else that's non-COVID related, all right? But I'll, I'll get back to that. All right, so the next question though, um, is the vaccine safe? Well, the, again, the person wants to know if you know if, the, if it's 100% sure that the vaccines are safe for MS patients. So 100% sure, no. 100% sure, no. But there's no reported events that have suggested that it is not. Um, individuals, I mentioned to you guys earlier, who are experts in immunology, experts in virology, have strongly, adamantly suggested that it is safe and that everyone should take it and these are people who work in particular in ms making that recognition not other disorders but in particular ms uh, so 100 percent is tough uh to be honest with you to say for sure that way because it's so early in its administration so early and they weren't necessarily targeting ms patients to put into their study that went over a year or so so That'd be hard to say from that perspective, but I am confident that's probably a very reasonable, safe thing to do. Yes, ma'am. Have there been any known yet side effects from taking the vaccine for an MS patient? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Not do you know about, like new, I'm do sorry. You know about the COVID? Sorry about that. Do you know about the COVID MS registry? I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. Okay. Can you tell the patients about it? Uh, well, basically, it, it, it is a registry trying to identify and collect data on individuals that have been exposed in varying circumstances and then report that data uh, when they have opportunity as well. So I think it, it is worthwhile entity in and of itself that helps long term. Right. And, and again, even on there, it talks about anybody that might have had side effects to um, a vaccine. So if anybody does not know about the COVID MS registry, you can either visit the MS Views and News website or the National MS Society or the MS Foundation, the MS Association of America. We all have on our websites how you can access the registry and see what's going on. OK. All right. Next. Um, how is uh, we're going to skip that one. All right. 
Do you think COVID-19 will always be present or will it be eradicated eventually? If, let's use an example, um, measles, other conditions, once everyone had their injection, every person, as time progressed in certain populations, certain countries, these infections were fully eradicated. And so in theory, rather than uh, counting on herd immunity, if everyone was actually injected, vaccinated, I should say, and the vaccination was effective, once again, I gotta say that too, in theory, in populations in countries, you could see potentially an eradication. Now here's, here's to the rub though. The rub is these variants that we're now hearing about, that from South America and other parts of the world that are now coming forward, will the vaccine that we're now getting cover us for that? And once again, that's the big question. And so if the answer is affirmative that it does, then what they're suggesting is a distinct possibility given time. If, on the other hand, it turns out that it doesn't really work, then we'd be in the exact same scenario with the flu vaccine, meaning that you get it every year, it will work in most cases well enough, but you have to get it every year um, because the, because the uh, flu virus in of itself varies so much that what you've gotten as an inoculation is not adequate. Okay, thank you for that. By the way, Cindy's very happy for the answer you gave her a few minutes ago, and she wanted me to let you know that, okay? She's like ecstatic. She says, I love this guy. All right. <laughs> All right. Next, we have Karen. Karen's online, and Karen wants me to ask, does a person with MS not on DME, D, uh, DMDs or DMTs have a stronger immune response and be able to avoid or fight COVID better? And that is so interesting. Sorry about this, but Karen, I wondered the same thing many months ago. So I actually, when the pandemic began, I said, it's time for me to stop taking my medication. <laughs> All right, doctor. I'm glad you did. So, so uh, the answer is your immune system is granted unique. You have MS. It's unique. However, you're not more protected against this virus. You, you are not. Uh, so therefore, you have an advantage over those on a disease modifying therapy because you can take it at any point and not be concerned about being immune suppressed and the, medica and, and the immune response that you get should in fact be as robust as any person in your similar age group. So your del delay is gonna be primarily how young you may be. Okay, thank you, thank you. We have a couple more COVID questions, but I'm gonna come back to them again in a minute. Um, regular questions. Person writes, I've taken Rituxan for years and years and know it's about time for, and feel that it's about time for a new drug. What would you suggest now? So one, often as part of that equation as well, is is it no longer working? If it's still working and insurance still pays for it, is you still accessible to it, there's no side effect issues, why change, first of all? But if you want it to change, but you want it similar, the Ocrevus is the similar. Same company that develops both medications, and the difference is that the Ocrevus or Ocalizumab is actually FDA approved for multiple sclerosis versus the Rituximab, which is not. Even though there's logic, there's reasonable explanation as to why it would be used, so most would probably have you go move to the Ocrevus or Ocalizumab. Others might, in fact, consider the Limtrata. Others might, in fact, consider the Mavinclad. Okay. All right, next, um, how would you compare intrathecal baclofen and oral baclofen when treating spasticity? Okay, so that's a very sort of, not necessarily complicated, but different. So typically the criteria for moving towards intrathecal baclofen requires you to have been on usually multiple muscle relaxers, ineffective, usually maximum doses of oral baclofen in of itself, ineffective, or the side effect profile was so dramatic that you're too sleepy, too tired, something else was going on, then you move to intrathecal where they actually implant a pump under the skin 
that then has another two that injects the medication um, in a special location, if you will, and then they then they fill this pump through your skin in a very, very sort of specific method, methodology. Keep in mind that often you have very stiff legs, or usually it's that case, very stiff legs, it's a part of this, and sometimes what you may not have, have realized is that when you are, are up, and you know your legs are stiff, you're using them as support. One of the things that would have been interesting is that when the pump is turned on, it's not full strength necessarily, but it's turned up enough to where they see an effect, and now your legs aren't stiff anymore but now they also can't support you. And I've had patients call me and say, but Dr. Walker, it made me worse. What, what's, what, what's going on here? What to help me? What happened is it removed a issue that was turned into an asset by you because humans adapt. Once the medication reduced all that tone, now your legs are wobbly and loose and won't support you. The minute the pump can be turned down to then get close to where you were, but yet not necessarily have the spatter to the same degree where you have pain and discomfort. Once again, it is, it is a very uh, difficult sort of mesh to get it all worked out perfectly for the individual, but it does work and work well in, in most circumstances. Okay, thank you for that. And now before I continue with any questions, I want to let everybody know Yes, we have a lot of programs coming up as we have since the beginning of doing things virtually. And in the month of March, we have nine events. Okay, nine virtual events that we're bringing you. We have two of them again per month. Um, I think March 8th is uh, physical therapy. And then two weeks later, again, that same type of program, different things that are being done on those programs. On March 3rd, we have Dr. Reiser from um, Birmingham, Alabama, she'll be on. That's next week. Then we also have an MS Conversations Now event with me, Damian Washington, and Dave Bexfield. And for anybody that doesn't know Dave Bexfield, he's with MS Active, MS Active, Active MSers, I believe it is, out in uh, New Mexico. Um, he does a lot of comedy. And the idea of this program is for us to show you all how adding a little bit of humor to your lives, adding a little bit of entertainment to your lives, even during pandemic, will greatly help to get rid of a lot of stress in your lives from this pandemic, okay? And um, it's a patient's outlook on it all. We'll, we'll talk about, you know, the, 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 our own illnesses with MS, uh, how we've been dealing with the pandemic and making it all very humorous for you and something for you to take along to the rest of your family. Um, then also uh, March 8th, March 9th, March 10th, we got more coming your way. Uh, um, you can see them all on our website, all right? We're, we're back on the 18th of March. This is part of a new series that we started on race, culture, and community. It's showing the, uh, the disparities that go on with multiple sclerosis, all right? And uh, an extremely important topic, you know, um, that uh, many companies, many organizations are now doing, focusing on. It's extremely important for people to learn better and everybody will get along. All right. Um, on the 19th, we have the MS Hub. On the 20th, we have a new program coming out, which we've never done before. And we're going to do this on, it's a Saturday afternoon, and we're going to do Pilates. All right. And I'm going to do it too. So this is going to be the first time that I'm doing Pilates, and I'm going to do it just to entertain all of you. Okay. And you can see how I'm uncoordinated with probably doing something like that. But um, the, uh, the last week of the month, we do have something. I don't know what it is right now, but we do have something going on. And uh, then we head into April. And again, it's eight programs per month. So I just want to let you know that we are here to keep you all informed. And again, these are MS Views and News programs. So we, um, we're we providing more of this than anybody else in the country. And in fact, earlier today, we did an international event with um, Shift.MS from the United Kingdom. It was an awesome event. And if you wanted to hear Queen's English, you missed it. But you will be able to watch it when when we publish this on our YouTube channel because uh, George Pepper, who's the CEO of Shift MS, um, was outstanding. And his English is, uh, there were times I had to translate his British to what you all will understand in American English, okay? Uh, yeah, it was a little bit funny. All right, so getting back to um, 
Dr. Walker, thank you very much for allowing me to say all of that. Not that you had a choice, but you know, I just threw it in there, but I, I have to keep everybody uh, humored in some manner, right? So next person wants to know with all this crap going on, all right? That's the best way I could say it is all this crap that's going on right now. How can he or she better handle the anxiety of even going out into public? Yeah. Common issue, right? Common problem. And, and, and more likely than not, you probably had some underlying or have some underlying anxiety in advance of this anyway. Uh, and that's that's often the case. And you may have had some, some depression that too often go together. And how does one do it? What you have to do is, first of all, determine why you're going out. Is, is what you're going out for is important or not important? And then two, you have to determine what's your safety risk. Are you risk averse, very risk averse, or not very risk averse? And then what methodology are you going to use to protect you and protect others that you're with? And and sometimes you need to actually uh, tune, tune, tune in to shows like we just heard here, MS Views and News, where they actually can inform you uh, about enough information out there to reduce some of that angst, some of that anxiety, and say, "Oh, I'm concerned about that. That was that's actually not a concern." Uh, but make yourself informed. And sometimes you actually may need to get that counselor or have that conversation. And fortunately, right now they are uh, more easy and more accessible because of the fact that that they are willing to do it by video. Uh, and and with that, you then can potentially get to that place to where you're now. You, you probably will ever be comfortable to get to that place where you're okay and, and then work towards getting comfortable. Uh, but you have to start somewhere and, and starting sooner than later is going to be very, very critical, very, very important for you. Because I have a, a relative who actually was always relatively reclusive anyway, naturally. And so they're loving this COVID thing. They're loving staying at home and being isolated. But as I go visit, um, they're becoming too comfortable with being isolated. I'm concerned that once uh, there is no COVID uh, concerns to speak of out there, I'm not sure they're going to in, enter the, the, the real world again because they haven't had to. And there's so many industries, particularly if you live in a nice, large city, you can order anything, order anything you want to eat, any, any item comes in the mail, and, and it comes timely. So as a result, a reality. So just that's the but therefore work towards moving out, but do it strategically. And I think you'll get there. Great, thank you. All right, I'm gonna take three more questions and that's it, all right? Cause I know the doctor is tired. He's gotta get up early in the morning and, and, and see a whole bunch of patients again. But before I get to those last three questions, if anybody needs a psychologist, uh, we have an excellent male doctor. His name is Dr. Rick Harris. Um, Rick Harris is seen by many. Um, he's spoken on these programs many times as well. And uh, we also have Dr. Gail Lewis and Dr. Gail Lewis is up in the New York area. And um, I know that they're both open to seeing patients right now. I mean, they have to fill their days too, right? And um, they are both very, very good. And Dr. Lewis, I'm, I'm allowed to say this, she too had, well, I'm not gonna say, it. she too has the reason to speak with you all, all right? I'll say it like that. But um, she um, she's really good. Dr. Harris is very good. And now I'm gonna get to my last three questions, all right? Um, not my questions, but you all. Christopher, we're going to read one from you, okay? Does a DMT's effect on lymphocyte count play a stronger role now, especially with COVID? Stronger role now. So do lymphocyte count play a stronger role now, especially with COVID? Okay, yeah. Okay, so basically with the disease-modifying therapy, it's going to reduce your immune response by reducing the lymphocyte count for most of them. Um, as a result, you may have increased risk or will have increased risk of being infected uh, with COVID. So yes, sir, which is why um, depending on what community you're in, what state you're in, um, you would move, move be moved up the line to get vaccinated sooner than later, depending on where you are. Definitely not Florida. <laughs> yes definitely not all right but um yeah he said i believe that some dmts have a strong effect than others in reducing them side count and i didn't read that uh, as i was doing the question but and, and that part is true it, it, there's, there's no question about that that the more modern or newer medications um i felt like they have a greater uh, suppression of the immune system uh and axis as opposed to the original uh, medication. That part is true. Okay. All right. Next one. 
Oh my God. Somebody tried sneaking in another one here, but we'll get to that in a minute. All right. I didn't, I didn't actually read what she wrote, but I'll get to it later. Andrea asks, I have a constant back pain. Can you advise what I can do to take, um, wow, to take easy my pain, to, I guess, to make it easier on her? Hmm. Okay. So it really depends on, you know, honestly, it really depends on the cause. Now, if you feel as though it's from your MS, then it would be symptomatic treatment, meaning the usual muscle relaxers, stretching, exercise, which would include physical therapy, operational therapy, depending on, on the mechanism, depends on if it stays in your back itself, does it radiate down your legs, which is a different scenario than it localized, does the MRI down your back show disc disease as well, does it show uh, MS in that given area, or lesions in that given location as well. So once again, there's a ton of different ramifications that may explain what you might need to get done. If it's MS lesions back there, then one might want to go with a medication that reduces the uh, neuro uh, nerve firing, so therefore your gabapentin, your, your pregabalin, uh, those kind of medicines are often used. On the other hand, if it's muscle primarily, then you may want to use something that's topical, um, that the patches and their creams as well that work. So it really depends. And then if you may see a pain specialist, then he or she may do injections back there. So the, the, the low back pain is a tough one because the implications of cause can be multiple. Even if you have MS, your back pain may be just mechanical, meaning that it's disc related uh, and uh, muscle related. Sure. Hey, my back pain is from putting suitcases in and out of the car every week to come up here and do these programs. OK, <laughs> so, yeah, that that and I feel like I'm gaining a, a lot older uh, under these lights. My hair is white, but without. No, it's not that white. All right. Um, before I get to a question from Cindy, which is very long again, um, I want to read what Lisa just wrote. She writes, thanks, Stuart, for again providing a great program. And thank you, Dr. Walker, for answering all of our questions. Very, very much appreciated, Lisa, and very much appreciated with the doctor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, Cindy is going to be our last question of the night. Oh, David just wrote also. Thank you. This presentation was superb. Thank you, Dr. Walker. There thank you me. go. You made the list, so that's good. You know, that means you get to come back again. Ah. <laughs> Great. Exactly. All right. From Cindy, and with this mRNA technology, BioNTech, perhaps we could have a vaccine developed down the road for MS. Yeah, sure. Is yeah, it I'm a really, it is a really interesting time, particularly for this technology and what it could provide in a wider spectrum um, than simply COVID. I don't know what she's saying. Gives me hope and wonder if you, what, do, what can you, or what do you feel about this hopeful? wonder. Okay. I mean, I think the idea is reasonable, meaning that the style and methodology used here is pretty unique. Um, and it allows these companies to bring something to market to help general society more immediate than not. And so the, the idea I think that she's getting at is that if we can do this, maybe we can actually identify what causes multiple sclerosis, either the methodology itself or the techniques itself. And I will tell you, it, it is phenomenal what man and woman are able to do when it comes to the, the research medium. And these people are geniuses. I mean, it is phenomenal what they do and how they do. Give them a task and they seem to get it done. And I think the focus on multiple sclerosis as a whole is really, really increased dramatically because in as much as we look at the, the, the end result, meaning that we now have 20 plus medications for MS, you got to remember that three, three plus decades ago, there was nothing FDA approved for multiple sclerosis. And so my point to you is that, that the investment, the financial investment is substantial, meaning that in as much as people are looking at medications, someone is also looking at that cure somewhere in this line as well, because with these medications, the name MS keeps popping up all over the place, everywhere, all over the world. And someone says, you know what? I got an idea. And so I think you, you are correct, is that this notoriety may be an asset in moving us forward and then make me a guy who now does the neuro-ophthalmology because MS is all cured. And I'd be... Very good, very good, very good. Thank you for everything. You know, I want to just say, uh, let me sign off with, first off, thank you to the doctor. 
Uh, Dr. Walker, you've always been phenomenal, phenomenal at all of our programs that we've had you speak. I cannot wait to get back to South Carolina to hear you and see you in person again. Um, and for everybody that's online, thank you very much for being here. I want to ask you all to please be safe. Remember to wash your hands and wear the damn masks. Okay. And, and one last thing, if you don't mind, often patients feel as though I'm wearing a clip on since this is the end. End it. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. So that's great. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for everything and everybody be safe. Okay. Do what you got to do and keep the world safe. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>